is going to be pushing the go button. Okay, go for it, Kim. Let's introduce this. Hello, we're ready to kick off the town hall for the master planning and engagement session. Uh, and my name is Kim Mahoney. I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor for Facilities and Campus Services with UAA. Thank you. Brian? My name is Brian Meisner. Um, I'm an Anchorage-based consultant, and I lead the team of consultants that's assisting UAA with this campus master plan update. Uh, Chris? Uh Christopher McConnell, I get to serve as the Director of Facilities Planning and Construction. And with that, I'll kick it to Jack. I'm Jack Fowler, I'm an architect and campus planner with UAA. We also have Michelle quietly over there. She's with Huddle, an Alaska-based consultant, and she's um, recording the notes and recording this meeting today. Um, Kim, do you want to give an overview before we get into the slideshow, or should we jump right into it? Uh, no, please go ahead and proceed. Jump into it. Thank you. Kick okay. Us off. Jack, it's time to share the screen and let's get going. All right. Looks good. So Jack, I'm hoping that you do a lot of the presenting. I'll do the overview to set the stage for what we're doing and, and what we're gonna see today. So um, what we wanna cover today is what you see on here for agenda, project schedule, lets you know where we are in the overall campus master plan um, process. I will share as a precursor to that, that this process started, um, I think it was last February. And our intention then was to move fairly quickly through engagement, public engagement, and engagement within the UAA community. And what we found through the spring um, with COVID in play was that there were a lot more voices to be heard than could be heard in the space we had available. And so we ended up extending that engagement phase uh, through through this March when we sort of put the button on it. And that gave us the opportunity to greatly expand our engagement activities. And we'll talk a little bit more about what those are. And so we're in the process now of drafting the master plan. So taking the output of that engagement, finding out the things that are most important from that and seeing how those things turn into strategic initiatives to affect the master plan itself. So a lot of today is about um, what we heard during that long state, uh, engagement stage, as well as the beginnings of the strategies that are emerging from that. And that'll be supported by some, some maps and data that a lot of them show the existing condition, but in many cases, it's the existing condition combined with what we've heard that's setting the direction for moving forward. And then we wanna leave space at the end of this for, um, for input and uh, hear your feedback. If you don't have time to give it the thought that you feel you need today. There's still lots of time for you to think about the things you've heard today. This will be recorded and will be available on the website. And there's a link on the website that allows you to provide written comments back to us so, so we can hear them after the meeting as well. So with that, um, let's go ahead and get to the next slide. Are you, are you able to move it forward, Jack, or is it stuck? One moment. So while they're doing that, I'm just gonna say that um, the accreditation process requires a current and relevant master plan for UAA and all of its campuses. And um, that is, since we have technical difficulties, I think it's a good opportunity to talk about that requirement. It's, a, it's, a, it's an institutional requirement for higher ed to, have to be accredited. And this is how we get there through the engagement process. And this, this meeting today is an important part of that engagement. And so I appreciate everyone's attendance and tuning in to hear the, the, the data and, and material that we've collected. Jack, are you ready yet? I am, sorry about that. Okay, and I'll add one more thing since Kim um, started on the things that drive the need for the update. The Board of Regents um, has a policy that campus master plans for each of the campuses in the university system be updated on a seven year basis. We're slightly past that seven years right now. We're at about year 10. The last update was uh, officially published in 2013. So I guess that actually makes us at page nine. So it's time. It's part of a rhythm of updates that happen on a regular basis that eventually get reviewed and approved by the Board of Regents. 
All right, Jack, it's all yours. Thanks so much for filling that gap. So as Brian said, we, met, we started the engagement in 2021 in the summer, a little bit even before. Uh, we largely completed that engagement in the spring of 2022, late spring. And today we're in this incorporation phase where we're, we're drawing in policy recommendations from the Board of Regents, from UAA itself, and other uh, groups across UAA as we continue to engage them. As most folks know, as you're creating something, the engagement, the response, the listening sessions never really stop. Uh, you just start drawing while you're listening at the same time. We hope to present to the Board of Regents in the fall of 2022 with a draft. There is a fairly quick turnaround of that draft to a second Board of Regents meeting the fall of 2022, later on in the fall of 2022. And that is a final, um, hopefully, final presentation and acceptance by the Board of Regents of the Master Plan. Brian mentioned a lot of this in the opening of the slide, but or of the slide presentation, but what we heard has largely um, grown and expanded as we bridged from a sort of large forum stakeholder engagement into a lot of times a one-on-one -on -one stakeholder engagement, one-on-one, uh, one-on -one, one -on, you know, three folks at a time, uh, opening it up to multiple means of responding on the website, uh, with surveys, um, with desks set up at the student union, uh, we, we started to engage much more people. And the responses became real visceral and, and very personal. And so we wanted to make sure to allow time and space for all of those comments to come in. What we heard can be summed up in, in five points. And we're gonna cover those on two slides here. The first three on this slide, what we heard was vibrancy matters. The presence of people is important. As we've exited the, uh, some of the pandemic closures, um, we've, we've developed a strong need to, to see each other again and to engage in this um, great academic space at the university. And so that was, that was really point one from a lot of different folks. We wanna make sure to encourage that and in the future, find ways to increase that. Uh, identity is important. Number, topic number two. The identity here we're speaking to is the identity of individual programs and schools, um, academic clusters, uh, as student support clusters. Folks want to feel the identity of their home on campus, their individual home and place on campus. Right now, as we'll see in our maps and data later on, we're spread quite thin over our campus. Uh, there's maybe a school with classrooms on west side and offices on the east side and engagement spaces between. Trying to find strategies to bring them together and closer together is what we're, we're looking to do. Outward facing student support. Folks, when they come, students, when they come to campus, they wanna, they wanna have a, a front door. They wanna have a, a place to go where they know they can get the full range of student support, student and academic support. Right now, like our student uh, academic clusters, academic programs, our student services are spread quite thin over campus in a, an array of different types of spaces and with a long path between them. We, don't, we wanna address that. Public and community access is vital. This ties a little bit back to the vibrancy question or to the vibrancy topic. Folks, when they're on campus, they want to engage in the community on campus, but they also want to engage in the Anchorage community on campus. Anchorage wants to engage on the UAA campus as well. See it as a community asset. So we want to look for paths and places where the campus and the public and the community can come together on campus at UAA and all of the community campuses across South Central Alaska. And then finally, a well-kept home shows attention and strength. This is the topic that we've been hearing a lot about in the news and the administration has been talking to the legislator about legislative uh, groups about, this is about housekeeping. This is about providing deferred maintenance funds and making sure that everything from the paint 
to the mechanical unit, to the roof is maintained and, and in, um, in good condition. This, the aesthetic of a well-maintained campus communicates a message, message to our funders, message to our students, a message to our faculty and staff. And we wanna make sure that message is one of investment and one of strength. All of these five topics we think can be summed up in really like one phrase. We need vibrancy and we need cohesiveness on campus, on the Anchorage campuses and all of the community campuses. Now we're gonna look at a little bit of the data uh, that helps maybe explain why we heard what we heard. The data we're gonna look at first is our enrollment trends. Historically, enrollment has been very important to master plans because the master planners identify a projected enrollment trend and then they size the university facilities to meet that trend. In the past, as we can imagine, those trends, those projections were, were very aspirational as we as a state grew and we're excited to be here. Actual enrollment didn't correlate with those trends. And so we wanna think about that as we move forward. What you see in the chart on the screen in gray are those past enrollment projections. In green, from about 1982 to 2021 is the actual campus, Anchorage campus enrollment. This is specifically the Anchorage campus. You can see there's no relationship between the two. And so what we wanna do is we want to look to the future in a way that provides flexibility for unanticipated events, flexibility for projections that don't necessarily meet what the actual uh, uh, enrollment turns out to be. We wanna remain flexible for the future. This chart shows the percent change since 1982 of Anchorage campus enrollment in green below. And then above that in yellow is the new construction on the Anchorage campus. You can see that Anchorage campus enrollment has had a percent negative percent change since 1982 to today. But new construction on the Anchorage campuses has exceeded 400% of its original square footage. Now this makes sense for a period of time because we were a frontier campus and we're a frontier state. And so we started from scratch. And so we're building, we're building, we're building until we become competitive with say the lower 48 and are able to uh, sufficiently provide services for our students, faculty and staff. There might come a point here where it starts to make less sense. As you can see, Anchorage campus enrollment's dropping, but yet we're still building. This is our enrollment density as compared to four-year public institutions. Four-year public institutions usually participate in the Society for College and Urban Planning. And that society provides a facility assessment on an annual, semi-annual basis. In 2021, 56 four-year public institutions provided data on the assignable square foot per student and a, an array of different square foot types or building types. Here we've highlighted three, instructional, study and library space and office. UAA currently has double the amount, more than double the amount of instructional space on average as compared to those four-year public institutions, about 52 and a half square feet per student. We have about 150% of the study and library space. We have slightly less office space than those peers. We aren't trying to establish in presenting this data, we aren't trying to establish what should be. We're not suggesting that we should be matching the four-year public institution average for all of these uh, space types. But we do want to provide context as we make decisions for the future. We also wanna be cognizant that these 
numbers will change as our enrollment changes. If our enrollment goes up, the amount of square foot per student will go down closer to the four-year public institution average. This is enrollment density, uh, kind of like how an architect would look at it. An architect would identify how much space is available, how many people can occupy that space according to building code, and then understand how many uh, times that those, those occupants need to occupy the space over a given period of time, say a week. What this chart essentially says is that the Anchorage campus could deliver all of the credit hours that it provided in the fall of 2021 in 10 hours if all of our instructional space was more or less filled. That means we're only utilizing 50%, we would only be utilizing 50% of our prime time. Our prime time right now where we want to offer classes is Monday through Thursday, 10 a.m. to 3. Again, we're not establishing what should be. We're just trying to provide context as we make decisions in the future. What this might say is that based on our current enrollment, we have more instructional space than we need. So now we're gonna look at maps. We're gonna look at maps in order to understand, again, those five topics that we heard at the front of the presentation. What we're gonna look at first are maps identifying academic clusters. Academic clusters, it's a term that's actually been kind of defined, I think, invented by our provost, but it's a, a group of colleges, departments, and schools that share university, and industry synergies. So there are a couple of colleges maybe that share students or have relationships between what they teach on campus. And then as those students leave, those students continue to have those relationships. What's unique here is it's a way to identify a group, but it doesn't adhere to the traditional silos of academia where all the business students are in one spot all the science students are in another, all the art students are in a third building. This identifies more of a web or maybe a more real experience from the student who might be taking a science class, but also might be taking a business and an art class and identifying a place or a lens to locate all of those programs relative to that student. Also, we should mention that there's not just academic clusters, there's student clusters. There's different kinds of student services, different kinds of student groups that present clusters. And we wanna identify those as well. Now we're gonna look at some existing conditions of these academic clusters and, and different programs. And we're gonna again, look what we're gonna see is that those programs and clusters are thinly distributed across campus, as we mentioned in the beginning of the presentation. <laughs> This is the academic cluster of business and industry. It's kind of a simple one, so we'll start here. This identifies in blue on the map on the right-hand side, the places where the College of Business and Public Policy and community and components of the Community and Technical College, CTC, occupy. In red, we've highlighted the Dean's offices. This is the College of Health cluster. It's a simple one, it's an anomaly. There's only one uh, component to the College of Health. So we're gonna skip over that. And we're gonna go to a prime example here, Arts and Humanities. You'll see here that the academic cluster of Arts and Humanities is occupying space all across campus, east to west. A student, faculty or staff engaged in this cluster, we have to think about, participate and walk to all of these buildings. You'll notice that in the red dots where the deans are, are also distributed across campus. Maybe some of this makes sense, but if we're trying to increase vibrancy, 
we're trying to increase cohesiveness on campus, we may want to start to gather these together. Science, technology, engineering, and mathematics cluster. This is a very good example of being spread very thinly across campus. And finally, social and behavioral health science academic cluster, another thin distribution across campus. This is a map identifying all the student service locations across campus. And then a dotted line, a path between all of those student services. All the way from west to east, in a very long inside, outside, up and down path that a student would have to take to participate in any number of these student services. Alaska Native Programs, ANSI, Alaska Native Strategic Initiative, has identified goals for providing enough space for our Alaska Native Programs. This map identifies in purple dots across campus the distribution of all of those programs. We want to make this a point and focus on this in our master plan in order to adhere to board policies and make sure that our Alaska Native programs have enough space. Some of these dots are great space, like the ANSEP buildings. Some of these dots, the space that they represent, is less uh, than that program needs. It might be missing a front door. It might be a little bit of back of house. We want to address that and provide a means for improvement. We're going to look at a different set of maps, a different set of maps that talk about flexibility, the flexibility of buildings on campus. So as campus grew, the oldest buildings on the UAA campus were built in a sort of simple way. They more or less continue in that manner today. As it grew, those are the buildings that we started with. As it grew, the institution grew, and we offered more specialized instruction and opportunities, our buildings became specialized. Conical Phillips Integrated Science Center, the Alaska Airlines Center, Engineering Industry and Science Building. These buildings are highly specialized and any change to them would represent an, a high level of investment relative to other facilities on campus. A good example of a very simple building would be maybe the Sally Monster Hall or even Rasmussen Hall, which doesn't hold expensive mechanical equipment or lab spaces, mostly office and traditional classroom space. This is a map that identifies the flexi relative flexibility of buildings on campus. Flexible ones being identified in green, semi-flexible in yellow and specialized buildings in red. The size of the dot represents the relative size of that building on campus. When we did this drawing, what we noticed were the specialized buildings were on the perimeter. The flexible spaces were on the inside, the interior of campus along the central spine. So what we have is a flexible spine and specialized nodes on the perimeter. Thinking back to the two, 2013 master plan, we had identified community interface zones on the perimeter of campus. What you'll see here in this map are green community interface zones on the campus's perimeter. These are mostly undeveloped parcels, and they provided the university for a future flexibility that would engage the community. On the inside, in an array of colors, are our core academic zones. If we think about this map and its intent, the 2000 and Campus Master Plan's intent to occupy its perimeter with flexible 
community space. And then think about what we just learned about our current campus facilities having a flexible core. We can kind of bring the two together. And what I mean by that are these two slides. In 2013, in green on the left, we have a campus perimeter surrounded by community interface zones, undeveloped and flexible for the future. On the inside, we have specialized nodes. In 2022, in an effort to increase density at the campus core and increase vibrancy and cohesiveness at the campus core, we have an opportunity to utilize our flexible facilities in green along the central spine and bring the community to campus, increase vibrancy and increase cohesiveness. That doesn't surrounded by specialized nodes. That doesn't exclude the 2013 parcels on the perimeter of campus from future collaboration, future development, but it just sets another priority at the campus core along the central spine for increasing vibrancy and cohesiveness on campus. So now we have a couple of different places to bring the community in. Now this sort of drawing inward or looking inward has actually been happening for a long time, just at a different scale. And then in 2013, the campus master plan had identified a priority to bring folks back, bring UAA faculty, staff, and students back from satellites in the Anchorage Bowl area back to main campus. Since 2013's master plan uh, adoption, the university has largely completed a lot of those efforts. In 2013, it sold 7th and A. Over a long period of time, moving kind of clockwise around the map, over a long period of time, it vacated University Center. That largely completed in 2020 and 2021. We still own, the university still owns University Center, but it is currently leased to other state agencies providing revenue for UAA. Again, continuing counterclockwise, we sold the diplomacy building in 2014. We vacated a lease in 2020 at the University Lake building, which is owned by the system office. And we vacated a lease in 2019 at the Chugiak Eagle River campus. So this, this focus to increase vibrancy, cohesiveness on the main campus has been happening for a long time. This is a sort of summary slide of, of where we just walked through and, and where we hope to go. And we hope to receive your input on this. Again, in summary, we want to increase in vibrancy, increase vibrancy and cohesiveness on campus. We want to be aware that our, flex, our enrollments may fluctuate up and down now into the future. And so we don't want to overinvest in growth. We want to be cognizant of unanticipated events that might affect us. We want to right size the campus experience to our current enrollment. And we want to welcome in adaptable, adaptable collaborators to engage with our current enrollment. We want to bring in the community to engage with our current enrollment. We want to be aware that our departments and programs are currently thinly distributed across campus. So we want to organize space in academic and student support clusters in a more consolidated manner with a front door and a home, an identified home on campus in order to increase vibrancy and cohesiveness with each cluster. We wanna recognize that our specialty buildings, our specialized high investment buildings are on our campus perimeter. And so as we increase vibrancy on campus, as we bring folks in, as we consolidate our vision for the future, we wanna prioritize the central spine for these future student engagements, services and enrichment, leaving our specialized buildings on the perimeters, maintaining them as the great assets that they are. 
So that's sort of our summary, some key strategies moving forward from that summary. Data, maps, enrollment, and engagement that supports it all. And we'd be interested in hearing your feedback on any of this. And we can open it up for questions, comments that we can take during the call. Or as Brian mentioned at the front of the meeting, we are providing um, through the website an address that you can provide comments to. And I'm not seeing any hands come up on the screen. This is, this is Heidi. Hi, Heidi. Hi. Thanks for holding this. Um, one comment um, is, <clears throat> excuse me, on the previous slide or the two slides back, the map where you outline um, how you've consolidated space um, from the various um, buildings across the, the city and the the area. I think that's going to be a really important slide and I've just noticed it from listening in on other presentations, just offering um, that history and that background on how you are consolidating and trying to bring things back onto main campus is going to be really helpful for the variety of stakeholders, faculty and staff. Great, great, yeah. thank you. Valerie? Yeah, I had a question. Um, on some of those maps, the ones where it shows the student support spaces, what are you considering, I guess, as student support? Well, there's a long list there. Um, well, and I guess I can say why I'm asking <laughs> that. I imagine um, I know why you're asking, yeah. <laughs> well, well, part of that is I'm kind of, because I come from advising um, and so, like I'm wondering, like an individual student might not need all of those supports depending what they are. Mm -hmm. um, especially like if, depending what their program is, they might only need like one, if, if, assuming these are maybe advising offices possibly, but if they would only need like potentially one, maybe two if they have a minor like advising offices. So it wouldn't really matter to have them clustered necessarily. Um, if that is kind of the goal with that, but then also, well, yeah, I guess I was just kind of curious what was being considered student services or student support, um, looking from an individual student's experience and where they might need to be for that. Yeah, I can help at a high level, uh, Chris here, at a high level, it included things like enrollment services center, for instance, or going to the bursar's office to pay a bill or get your wolf card or go to the library for support, um, learning commons over on West campus. So it's, it's kind of comprehensive, all those touch points that take you all across campus. It was highlighting that kind of <clears throat> that spread that currently exists or or also including things like you know the um, satellite location for the bookstore over at the alaska airline center um, it wasn't uh, i don't believe we actually surveyed specific advisors office or locations um, as a part of this this summary but those uh, well, could be considered except for like psb with first year advisor yeah that, that's the only advising that's correct. That's the only advising office that we've highlighted in this student service location map is that first year advising and PSB. Yeah, and, and I think this is Kim Mahoney. And I guess what I would say is that, you know, this map, the, ANSA, the uh, Alaska Native map and the academic cluster map, um, you know, Jack touched on it by saying like, this is a, this is representative of exist, so, sort of like the existing condition or the current state. And we're trying to grapple with what it means for prioritizing uh, alignment around improving the vibrancy and the engagement and the experience for students. And some things that we're hearing are, gosh, wouldn't it, maybe we should be thinking about the student experience from a first year per perspective and maybe trying to hone in on that as a priority for improving that, that experience. You know, recognizing that a student would go all across campus, but maybe some of the support network around the first year or second year experience should be, should be 
huddled or clustered, perhaps. Do you have any thoughts? Does anybody on the call have any thoughts about that idea? I do. <laughs> um, coming from first year advising, um, what seems to be really nice for students um, who are first year students, it seems like a lot of the courses that they would take in their first year, like the writing and the math and some of the initial GERs tend to be more on the west side of campus, which is near the learning commons, it's near the first year advising office. Um, not all the advising offices are over there, but most of the advisors probably that they would engage with are on the west side of campus. And so it is nice, except for the fact that there are students who live in the residence halls. And so they have to get all the way over to the west side of campus. Um, and that's been really problematic with not having a shuttle, which I know is not <laughs> necessarily in your purview, but um, that has been kind of a bummer. So you have first year students who have to walk all the way across campus and hope that they don't get lost um, trying to get to where then they're kind of in their little cluster of kind of the first year classes and support um, on the west side of campus. But I do think that once they kind of shifted with first year advising coming on, um, they started scheduling it in that way. And that has been really nice for students and for like from the advising perspective of helping them put together schedules. Uh, there's very few classes, although there are a few where students have to go all the way across over to like the admin building or fine arts, which sometimes depends on their major. But for most of them, they can kind of get familiar with that side of campus before really having to, you know, run across campus a lot. Thank you, Valerie. Anybody else on the call have any questions? And check the chat. Michelle, did you check the chat? Yeah, I've been watching the chat and I haven't seen any questions come up. Oh. Okay. Oh, S Steve Rollins. Yeah, well, I, I just have a Steve comment. Was. So yeah. just to react to the last conversation here, where you have the building names on the previous slides so for the clusters, the academic clusters, and you actually identify physical locations. I know that you don't have that for this slide and you don't really list the physical locations for the Alaska Native programs. But we should. And it, it probably would be helpful because I started looking at this and I thought, yeah, I'm not quite sure what, we're, what these dots represent exactly um, in terms of uh, student services, right? So, I mean, here, here you have the library as a dot here, and I guess that's because of where a wolf card center, I guess. But anyway, it, it, it's just that you did a good job on the other ones with naming the physical locations. It might help people understand this one better. And, and the next one, I think, right? Yeah, yeah it would. Okay. Thank you. Anyway, that was my two cents worth on that. <laughs> well, if there's no other questions, Brian, I think we're yeah, you know, and I, I, oh. I, you know, I just because I'm the librarian here, I just have to make a comment too. I noticed the libraries in the humanities cluster. I have to make the point that we do serve the other academic clusters as well. So Certainly we're do. not just the humanities based operation, but just to make a lot that, of student services. No, I mean, when the we're library. back in the, like you have us in the, in, in the actual cluster. cluster, in the clusters, yeah. Right. Um, but, you know, we're not in the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics cluster. And certainly we have a role in serving those programs, right? And we're not in the, let's see, which, we're not in the social and behavioral science cluster. So anyway, I, I just want to maybe, since I'm the head librarian, you know, make the point that the library is really part of all of the academic clusters in terms of disciplines. That's all. Steve. True. Steve, I'd love to follow on that conversation because um, emerging towards the end of the engagement, this idea of student support clusters started emerging and we're not sure yet what those are, but it's a very powerful I idea um, because there are student administrative support functions, but there's also student learning support functions. And we were starting to thinking, wow, that's where places like the library may start fitting 
is as a student learning support cluster, like not tied directly to it academic, but as an overlay. I'm curious of your feedback on that idea. Well, I, I think the library is assessed by the resources that we make available, not just online, but as well as on site for the vast array of academic programs um, across the campus. So, it, I mean, I think student learning is a very important part of the library's role, but the fact that we have resources that are made available, uh, just the other, the other week we, have, we had construction management's accreditation program review team here on, on campus. Mm -hmm. And what they wanted to see was the library and how well the library supported construction management. Right, so um, every, every program uh, accreditation usually has a library visit or a library component in the standards. Uh, Northwest as an institutional accreditation body has a library standard. So it, the library is more than just, I'm, I'm first reacting to that we're more than just a humanities mm -hmm. uh, based uh, resource center. We have resources for all of the disciplines across the campus. And that idea about being a place for discovery of information, discovery of knowledge across the dis different disciplines is, is what we put a lot of effort into as well as serving as a student learning center. So those are two roles that we have and you can't really dismiss very easily the, the resource center role, access to information role, the right, collection which, building role, right? Which applies yeah. to students, faculty, and community. It does, it does. Well, it's a good conversation. I think it will be interesting to figure out how, how things like the library fit into this language of clusters. Yeah, I mean, the medical library is on the second floor of the consortium library, and that's used by the nursing program. It's used by the um, allied health programs. We have two medical librarians that's working right. on that area. Mm -hmm. so, anyway, just to make the point that we're not, you know, a lot of times people think the library, you know, is a place of books that uh, the English department, and the humanities department appreciate and nobody else, but we actually used across the, the whole range of research and student studies. Looks like Phil has a question. Hey, Phil. Hey, Jack. Uh, great presentation. I enjoyed it. Um, I'm uh, I'm wondering if the the uh, proposed or unproposed or funded and unfunded addition to uh, Elmore Road uh, factored into any of your planning, or does anyone know where that project lies right now? Well, Chris, I'd be happy to take that yeah, one. There, we have an official response to this question. And I think Kim or Chris have been practicing. Well, I think that the answer is um, that it's a question that's going to be a question probably for a long time and, and, uh, and probably not one that we're going to tackle with this effort. We're going to focus our effort on what we see as our biggest risk and problem, which is increasing vibrance, which is currently, we're thinking it is related to increasing vibrancy and cohesiveness on campus. Like how do we bring people in? How do we create this uh, destination for the community and for increased recruitment and retention? So, you know, I think that's what this master plan is focused on. And the, the concept of the extension, is an important conversation for the university, but I hope it doesn't become the conversation because what we need to be talking about is increasing our enrollments and getting people invested in coming to this campus. That's the bottom line. So it sounds like this has come up before. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Thanks, Phil. Say Valerie has her hand up again. I have another thought as I'm just kind of thinking about this. Um, so now speaking from Native Student Services um, perspective on the Alaska Native um, programs or whatever it said, MAP, um, 
one thing that is important and kind of what I, I have a, I have a fairly good idea of probably what those spaces are. Um, like the one kind of way down bottom ish, right. Is the Chibai room. I'm going to guess, um, which yep. like, so in terms of clustering that is important to have for that space to be there for the residential campus students. So I think we're, we can't like completely cluster everything because there are some spaces where it's, it's nice to have stuff spread out a little bit. So if a student happens to live in the residential campus, they have a spot to go and a space to, to spend time. Um, so I think that also is, is important. Um, whereas like some of these, we through the Alaska Native Success Initiative also from the NSS perspective, requested to move some of the offices or like who they report to, to under NSS. Cause I'm gonna guess maybe the far West one might be RAN, um, the Recruitment and Retention of Alaska Natives into Nursing, which is more of a student support program rather than academic. And so we've requested that that completely be moved under NSS out of the College of Health, um, which I know is slightly controversial to the College of Health, but um, that that was something that a recommendation we made, which then that would make sense for it to like live at the NS, like with NSS in a clustered space um, as kind of a student support all together. And you would just go talk to the RAND person there. Um, but I do think like some of the spaces are intentionally kind of separated from any sort of cluster idea because they serve a, a certain purpose for students in a specific area of campus. Well, I want to thank you for your contribution um, to the discussion. We, we, as a master planning team, want to engage with the ANSI team um, often and again. Uh, we've met with some members through this engagement process, but I think it's now time to, to, to meet with the, the right members of the team again so we can really get clarity around how we can Im improve um, the master plan in this context. These location cluster kind of concepts doesn't necessarily mean that all of these need to be together. It just means like there's a discussion around how we consider and con con contemplate space in, in the context of Alaska Native programs. What is the right place? Um, so it's probably going to still look a, a similar to this in some, in some form going forward um, for a long time. Like ANSEP has a beautiful building here in the center of campus. And they also have a, um, a middle college program, the, their acceleration program. You know, these are separate identities that are well-branded and we're not suggesting to, to group all of this together by any means. And for the reasons that you stated that this program should stay closely connected to residence life. Um, I wasn't aware about anything um, over on the west of campus relating to health. What I thought that that dot meant in, in my understanding was the Alaska Native classroom, um, the Alaska Native Studies classroom. But what you brought up about the connection with health was interesting to me. And so it's just, it just brings some richness to the conversation and importance to understand as we go forward, we need to know what these things are and, wh and where there's synergy and where there's not synergy. Um, wh what should be co-located together? What needs a front door? Um, Native Student Services is behind the Multicultural Center. Um, that probably isn't the right idea going forward. So it's a long conversation. And again, we're just, uh, it's, it's good feedback today and, and, and thanks for bringing it up. Definitely, thank you. And that is, you are probably, <laughs> I'm sure you're correct, but that's the last Native Studies classroom. I could, didn't even think of that, which I, I do think is interesting. <laughs> it's really far from where their office space is located on the other side of campus. So I think yeah. in that sense, it definitely makes sense to bring them together. Another thing um, that I know we've talked about in our space, because there have been like a variety of conversations about like co-locating Alaska Native Studies and NSS 
Um, and one thing that has come up is that the Alaska Native Studies program serves a variety of students, not just Native students, um, whereas NSS is pretty much specifically Native students, sometimes rural students, but it's a pretty not common. Um, our, our main focus is serving Native students on campus. And so part of what we had been talking about is like co-locating makes sense, but if we're in the same space, like just making sure that we are creating still a safe space for our Native students um, where there's not, because Alaska Native Studies, like there's an Alaska Native theme GER. And so it's like the entire campus might end up taking an Alaska Native Studies course and need to talk to their professor. So having separated spaces for that reason where we still have a, a special kind of space for the students we serve versus all the students who end up taking Alaska Native Studies um, is something we thought would be important to also consider um, going forward. But it, I mean, the, the clustering makes sense in, in that sense because um, there, there are a variety of things that maybe our students might need to talk to the professors over there because they do end up taking their classes, but they, Alaska Native Studies serves a much wider population or broader population than we do. Valerie, in, here, in hearing you talk about, oh, sorry, Jack, um, this is Brian. In hearing you talk about these spaces, it, it makes me realize there's a conversation that needs to be happen, happening about which of the spaces want to announce themselves and which of them want to remain a, a place of retreat and, and wellness, because there's a difference the two. So if everything's announcing ourselves, you may lose some of that retreat feel that, that some of the spaces may need. Yeah, I definitely, I think that is the, an important distinction. Um, whereas an academic program, like a lot of times students might be going to that space more for office hours or um, maybe to talk about projects they're doing in a class or, you know, things like that. Whereas the things that we do at Native Student Services are so different. Um, and it's definitely more like very specific student support. Um, and there is advising happening here and there's, but there's events and there's, we just really want students to be able to come to Native Student Services and feel like they belong, feel like they're safe, feel like they can talk to people who understand where they're coming from and have similar backgrounds. Um, and so that is for us a pretty big distinction between what um, the offices of Alaska Native Studies might maybe be um, doing or like their purposes or who they might be seeing or who's coming into that space. So yeah, like we are definitely more on the, like we want to provide a space of wellness for students um, and a specific population of students. Well, thank you for that. Thanks, Bill, Valerie, and Steve. Great comments. So I'm checking the chat and not seeing any more um, comments there, and I'm not seeing any hands up. Maybe give one last chance to provide some feedback in this event. We can always provide feedback later. So later we are having a, um, another town hall uh, with different content um, that's scheduled, scheduled April 6th and the Zoom link is available on the website. May 6th. May 6th. Well, let's wrap this up. Um, I want to thank everybody for attending today. We'll be posting this and Michelle, thank you for helping us with the recording of it. Uh, and we'll catch you at the next one. Have a great